762 by 39 versus 308. The battle of the 30 caliber battle cartridges begins right now. This is Dave Trillo, and you're listening to the Ammunition Guide Podcast, brought to you by Ammo.com. Today, we're going to compare two very incomparable cartridges, the 308 and the 762-39. It's really a battle of the AR-10 versus the AK-47, but Chris, why, why are we comparing two such dissimilar rounds? Now, before we get started here on this caliber comparison with 762 by 39 and 308. I want to encourage you, if you haven't done so already, make sure you click that link down in the description or in the pinned comment and get yourself a coupon for $20 off your next ammo order here at ammo.com. We want to do this as a special guest or a special gift rather for all of our listeners because we value each and every one of you. And we're so glad that you've watched our video. Now let's get right into it. Well, you know, I think a lot of people think that, you know, 130 caliber is the same as the other, and it's it couldn't be further from the truth. Also, you know, these definitely faced off on the field of battle in Vietnam for a time. And so I think it's interesting just to kind of take a look at the two different cartridges and, you know, see how they relate and see how they're so dissimilar and why sometimes what you're looking to do really matters when you pick out the cartridge for your next rifle. Now, with these rounds, is it really boiled down to one putting a whole lot more energy behind a 30 caliber bullet than the other? I think that's part of it, but I, I think uh, there's also an aspect to it. You know, you mentioned, you know, the AR-10 and the, the AK-47. I mean, obviously the AK, uh, you can put a whole lot more rounds on target faster. Uh, so mm -hmm. I think that there's, that's definitely an aspect, but I mean, you know, size comparison wise, I have both of them right here. Uh, you know, a 308, the one on, uh, our viewers, what you'll look at at the left, the gold one, uh, is considerably bigger than the silver one. Uh, and there's a reason for that because, you know, the 762, uh, by 51, otherwise known as the 308 Winchester is just a bigger cartridge. Uh, and it, it puts a whole lot more force out, like you were saying, Dave. If we wanted to do a more apples to apples comparison, would we compare the 308 to a 762 54? Uh, you know, that's definitely something that you could do. The, uh, the 54 R, uh, what, uh, fires, uh, from the Mosin Nagant or, uh, some of their, uh, their other belt fed machine guns, uh, that I think would definitely be a more apples to apples comparison. Uh, but you know, today we're, we're looking at the, you know, the seven, six, two by 39, which is a very potent round, you know, inside 300 yards. Uh, the Russians really built this one up very well. Yeah. Yeah, now I know the cartridge actually preceded the design of the AK-47 themselves. It did, yeah. I think his bosses went to Kalashnikov and said, we have this round. Mm -hmm. You know better than to argue with us, develop a rifle around it. <laughs> it's like, yes, you will make a rifle with this round. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so and Kalashnikov, more than willing to. I love oh, yeah. the, story, the story of uh, yeah, he conceived the need for a reliable automatic rifle after all his buddies got killed fighting the, uh, the Nazis. Yeah, absolutely. It was quite a story and man, he made quite a rifle to say the least. And you're right. The, the SKS pre, uh, predates the AK 47 and it really is a difference in design because if I recall, uh, in the beginning, Stalin was saying like, well, if we give our guys removable magazines, they'll just lose them. So I want, you know, a, a stripper clip design because that way they can't lose it as easy. Boy, he was just uh, such, a, such an intelligent and caring leader. I know, I know. Uh, the, you know, the SKS itself is actually a very potent rifle and a great little plinking gun if you can get your hands on one. Yeah, I remember when you used to be able to pick those up for like 150 bucks. Oh, God, yeah, they were cheap as free. Uh, AKs, too, to some degree. But oh, yeah. And Mosin the Gants, for that mm -hmm. matter, used to be a dime a dozen. But... Uh, you know, let's let's not look back to fonder times, right? Back in back podcast. in the good old days, right? So let's t give me give me an idea, because like you said, the uh, the AK really pounds targets within a three hundred yard range, but the three hundred eight is 
is pretty much going to triple that effective range to my understanding. Oh, absolutely. The effective range on the 308 is astounding, especially with proper loading. Uh, if you're into reloading like I am, you can really stretch your legs on a 308 and you can get it out to a thousand yards. It's not necessarily the best thousand yard cartridge, but it'll get there uh, with the proper bullet. The 175 Sierra Match Kings are what you're going to want to use for that because the higher ballistic mm -hmm. coefficient. Uh, but yeah, uh, effective range on 308, easily triple that of 7.62 by 39. But again, I think it's it comes down to what you want the rifle to do. It's like, do you want something that's lighter weight? Because I mean, let's be honest, an AR-10 or you know a bolt action 308 is not necessarily a lightweight rifle. Uh, it's got a lot of heft to it. It's got a lot of material, whereas you know, your AK, SKS, considerably lighter. Yeah, now the AK... Uh... I mean, God, it's, it's, it's children can manage to fire it and they often know. do, unfortunately. Yeah, uh, it, it truly is. It, it is a design in simplicity and effectiveness uh, and it's very lightweight, which really helps. And it also helps the recoil as well. I think that's the big thing. And we, we talked about this when we did 223 versus 308 was the difference in recoil because, you know, popping off a full mag in 308, uh, you know, full auto is going to be an experience like a shoulder pounding experience. Whereas, uh, you know, your AK going to be much more comfortable to shoot full auto. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have one and, and I, I love, I feel like it has just enough recoil. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't like like no recoil when I'm firing a, uh, a rifle like that, obviously for, you know, I expect no recoil for my 22 short. Of course. But, um, it just has a nice chugga, 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 like you're really firing a machine gun. That's, that's a great experience. Yeah, that is a really good way to explain it. And I have to agree. I have an RPK myself uh, on a bipod, and it is just a joy uh, to shoot. I love that rifle to death. And uh, I have to agree with you. You know, when you are shooting something like that, it is good to have a little bit of recoil just to know that you're actually shooting something. Uh, and it's It's fun. Honestly, you know, getting out there and just, you know, doing a little bit of plinking down on the range and, you know, lighting up some targets and not having to, you know, worry about this heavy, you know, impulse coming back into your shoulder is really a more enjoyable experience. Yeah, no, it's got that nice, it's such an easy rifle to take apart. It's got like oh, yeah. three pieces and you see that nice spring mm -hmm. that, that takes up almost the, the whole length of the barrel. It really, uh I feel like as dumb as I am, I could figure out how the AK really works if I sat down and took mine apart for a while. Oh, yeah. I mean, that short stroke gas piston design is really innovative, incredibly reliable, uh, and it just doesn't get dirty like the AR-15 or the AR-10. I mean, you know, the, the, the saying is, you know, the AR platform with the direct gas impingement kind of likes to, well, I'll, I'll use the, the, you know, appropriate terms. It likes to poop where it eats. Uh, you know, with all that gas coming back to actuate the, the bolt carrier group on an AR, it's definitely a lot dirtier than with the AK. It's all held up there in the gas block and it's m a much cleaner system. Mm -hmm. But then there's the X factor because uh, I feel like you can't have a conversation about these two rounds without talking about the relative pros and cons of steel cased ammo. Oh, yes. Steel cased ammo. That is a good point. And uh, as you can see here with this one, this is definitely a steel case here. It's nice and silver. Uh, and it, it, there's definitely a lot of, you know, information and misinformation about this because uh, especially surrounding AR-15 using, uh, you know, steel case ammo in your AR-15 uh, or AR-10. A lot of guys don't like doing it. And I don't necessarily think that it's the issue with the steel case, more so the bimetal jacket that they have on the tip of the bullet for most of these mm -hmm. rounds uh, is pretty offensive to your barrel for long-term use. You, you believe that, that the steel and the bimetal jacket, uh, and to be sure, a bimetal jacket is almost 100% one kind of metal. It's a very misleadingly named feature. Yeah, it's just kind of like a brass wash, uh, basically, yeah. what they do, or copper wash. Yeah, so it's all it's all soft steel, mm -hmm. and of course, when ranges say they don't want steel cased ammo, what they really mean is they don't want ammo with bimetal jacketed bullets. Yeah, exactly. It can definitely, you know, if they're using a steel trap uh, in the back of the range, like a, a snail trap that some ranges do, uh, those bullets can actually damage uh, the steel trap and cost you know the range, uh, you know, money, which is something that they're trying to make, not to spend. 
Uh, so that's definitely an issue. But I, I think a lot of the question around the steel case comes with this extraction. Uh, people think that the steel case is hard on extractors, like it wears on them or it wears your springs down. And, you know, from what I've seen uh, from all the data, I don't think that the steel case actually does all that much to your extractor in an AR platform and obviously not in a uh, an AK platform because they're meant to handle it. Yeah. I mean, I'm no metallurgical savant, but I know the the case that the steel is made of is softer than whatever your rifle's extractor is made of. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I mean, it will wear it down eventually. I've seen some torture tests where they put, you know, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of rounds of steel case ammo through an AR-15 with the standard extractor. But I mean, let's be honest here. We're talking about like a $5 part. Uh, it <laughs> is not that difficult to change out an extractor if you really find that you're having problems after oh five six thousand rounds of steel case ammo uh you know a, a punch and a new extractor and you're good to go here's a couple more really common myths surrounding mm -hmm. uh steel case ammo a lot of our customers just assume that it's corrosive oh yes it the corrosive ammo must be pointed out that the russians well, the reason that people associate corrosion with steel cased ammo is because there was so much Soviet Cold War era surplus ammo coming through. And I think America and its allies stopped loading America and its allies stopped loading corrosive primers around the fifties. Mm -hmm. But it was so much cheaper. I think the Russians kept doing it and all that surplus kept flowing into the market and we kept seeing those corrosive primers until pretty recently. Yeah, absolutely. And that that is the the big thing. It's the uh the mercury and the uh and some of the salts basically in the primers. Uh it's it's a byproduct of the detonation. Uh and it's hygroscopic, meaning that it attracts water. So you get these salts into your barrel and on your bolt and in your, you know, your receiver, and it attracts water out of the atmosphere, causing it to rust. That's where the corrosion comes from. Uh like you mentioned, uh all US ammo basically after Korea. Uh, was non-corrosive. Uh, if you find some .30-06 ball that was, you know, World War II or Korea, if you can find it, then yeah, it will have a corrosive primer in it. And you'll need to really just really scrub down your rifle. You don't have to do anything crazy like getting Windex. I know that that was a big myth on the internet. You got, everybody's like, oh, the ammonia will uh, neutralize the salts. It's like, no, it's, yeah. it's the water. You just got to wash it out. It's just the water. Mm-hmm. Because I've heard more intense solutions to corrosion than that. Uh, oh, Domestall yeah. solution being mm -hmm. one of the most popular. And I'd heard that fellas used to uh, urinate down the barrels of the rifles back when the war time. I've heard that too. I'm telling you, the, the fact that there's not a bolt hold open on some of these it really makes me hesitate about putting, you know, my man bits down into the, <laughs> the chamber there to take a leak down my barrel. Uh, oh, my, imagine grand thumb on. Oh, no. <laughs> Oh boy, there's Everyone a lot. Look up, look up Garand Thumb. Uh huh. Favorite. Yeah, no, I, I can, uh, man, there's a lot of different things we could say about that that wouldn't be appropriate for this video. But uh, no, no, yeah, get I've banned from YouTube in this episode. Exactly. We'll get red flagged immediately. We'll get pulled off yeah. YouTube. So we're not going to go there. But uh, yeah, I've heard those too. I've heard all those stories. But honestly, all it really takes is just proper gun maintenance. So here's my, my way to tell if ammo is corrosive. If it comes out of a Russian spam cam and it has like Russian lettering on it, it's corrosive. Mm -hmm. uh, and some people are like, oh, well, this is mildly corrosive. Okay, corrosive is corrosive. I don't care how mild or harsh it is. You have mm -hmm. to clean your rifle after your range session. There's none of this, oh, I'll do it after the weekend. I'll do it in a couple days. No, once you get home, you clean your rifle. And if you're very thorough, you scrub out that chamber. Uh, you know, you're Now, for this one, if you are using an AK, you will need to scrub out your gas block as well as well, excuse me. So you will need to learn how to, to field strip that down. Uh, but other than that, uh, there's no reason you can't shoot corrosive ammo out of your rifle. You just have to do proper maintenance afterwards. I feel like we should do a whole podcast on steel cases and burden primers and we corrosion. Could. What I really wanted to ask, mm -hmm. all right? So I've got my AK-47. I've never thought of it as a hunting rifle. Yeah. And yet, you know, companies like uh, Sierra and Mosler, they, they make a lot of polymer tipped 762-39 hunting rounds. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, I just, uh, am I right to think that within 100 yards, it's kind of the same rules as what applies to an AR-15, I can hunt with my AK? 
Absolutely. Uh, you know, the AK has enough kinetic energy to ethically harvest a deer, a uh, white-tailed deer, no problem, especially within that range. Uh, you can probably push it out to about 150, but that's kind of getting towards the raggedy edge where you're getting below that 1,000 uh, foot pounds. Uh, that's kind of the rule of thumb for a whitetail. They say you need about 1,000 foot pounds to ethically harvest mm-hmm. a deer. Uh, but yeah, your AK can do that. And I think that uh, a lot of this kind of came about with the 300 blackout, which is a round that we'll talk about here on the channel soon. Uh, but a lot of people started hunting with their 300 blackout and then they're like, well, wait a minute. This has almost the exact same, you know, ballistics as the 762 by 39. Why haven't I been using that? And it really offers a very nice, you know, light recoiling rifle that really can put the hurt on to medium to even small size game if you want. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, as a varmint gun, it's oh, yeah. uh, it's top notch. Keep it in the back of your A2V and watch out, Mr. Prairie Dog. Oh, definitely. That or, you know, woodchucks or coyotes or whatever is, you know, causing problems on your property. You know, you got yourself an old beater AK or an SKS that you really don't care if it gets mud on it or anything like that. Man, strap that thing on the four wheeler or in the back of your, uh, you know, your truck on your rifle rack and it'll always be there for you when you need it uh, to take care of those varmints on your property. But to continue on the theme, I think the 308 is the most popular whitetail cartridge in the country. Oh, yeah. Easily. Uh, I mean, the, the 308, as far as a hunting cartridge is concerned, really took off uh, once Winchester started offering it to the civilian population uh, after it was adopted by the military. And it has become probably one of the most popular hunting rounds out there because it does exactly almost everything that the out 6 can do with a smaller, lighter cartridge, uh, mostly due to, you know, advancements in smokeless powder and cartridge design and things like that. The 308 doesn't really lose a lot to the 30 out six, uh, and that has really pushed it up there as far as one of the top hunting cartridges in the North American region. You can definitely hunt in Africa with it, some of the smaller game, maybe like the Springbok and things like that. But if you're looking to go do, uh, you know, Cape Buffalo or anything bigger, uh, you're going to want a bigger cartridge than the 308. Oh, yeah, especially Cape Buffalo, which I understand will hunt you if you just wound them. Oh, yeah, they are nasty. You don't want to mess with them. Now, death by bovine is pretty low on my ways to go. Yeah, I, I got to say that's pretty low on my list too. So make sure you bring enough gun if you're going to go after Cape Buffalo. And yeah, 308 ain't enough. Now, I know. But remember, if you yeah. kill one with a 22 LR, you're a hero. That's true. That's true. You get put on that uh, that list of crazy people who tried to do it. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't try it. Uh, just my recommendation. I don't even think a shot between the eyes on a Cape Buffalo with a 22 is going to cut it. Boy, you'd want to forget about it. I'm not. Don't try this at home, folks. Exactly. Exactly. Trying to say there's now, a disclaimer. Self-defense. Now, Chris, what's interesting to me is uh, although the 308 dominates for hunting medium game, oh yeah, it, it flips it around. I'd way rather have the 760 239 on my side during a home defense scenario where there's really no way I'm going to have to fire farther than 50, 60 yards. Oh, definitely. You know, I think there's a couple, of, you know, benefits to considering 762 by 39 for home defense or self-defense over 308. Now you might be going there, well, you've got more kinetic energy with 308 and it's got a flatter trajectory and that's all true. But don't forget about the issue of over penetration. I think that is the biggest issue with the 308 for home defense. Will it defend your life? Absolutely. Uh, it will absolutely do it, but it could end up two houses down too, uh, which isn't a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. A couple other considerations. I mean, recoil and accompanying mm-hmm. muzzle rise. Oh, yeah. uh, don't count on your best aim when your life's on the line. If you miss that guy and it sends your barrel flying upward, he's going to have that much more time to retaliate. And he knows you're playing for keeps at this point. The other thing is the rapport mm-hmm. of the 308. You might actually permanently damage your hearing if you fire that thing in your bedroom. That's something that a lot of people don't consider. Uh, and because we're so used to shooting outside, right, with an outdoor range where there's nowhere for that sound to bounce off of for the most part. But when you're indoors, the report of that rifle is going to be considerably louder because the sound waves are going to bounce off the walls. And uh, what's not going to bounce off the walls is your bullet. Uh, and so that is definitely like, I, I know I'm harping on the overpenetration thing here, but the 760 by 39 is going to be a bit quieter, all things considered, and mm-hmm. you're going to have less overpenetration. So yeah, if you 
say I've either got to have an AK or, you know, an AR-10 for home defense, I'm taking that AK every time for the quicker shot uh, follow-up. Uh, you know, because of that muzzle rise is going to be less, you're going to be able to pop off more rounds quick, more quickly, and mm -hmm. it's going to be quieter and I'm not going to have to worry about over penetration as much. Yeah. Muzzle rise, pretty much negligible on the AK. Oh yeah. You can just keep that barrel trained right on your, uh, right on your point of aim. Uh, you know, you really can't harp too much about the perils of over penetration. You might defend your home, but you know. You know, I, I think I've said this on here before, but I'll say it again because it bears repeating. I had a firearms instructor tell me once that in a self-defense situation, every bullet you fire has a lawyer attached to it. So before you pull the trigger, make darn well sure you know what your backstop is and what's behind your target. Yeah, especially in today's political climate where oh, so Lord. many anti-gun DAs are out for blood. If they mm -hmm. decide to make a, a martyr out of you. Oh, yeah. You you do not want to be the face of a political movement against guns just because you wanted to defend your own. It's definitely an issue, uh, and it's something that, you know, you need to consider uh, if you're going to carry. Now, obviously, this is not a, a – neither of these cartridges are concealed carry cartridges, but, uh, you know, if you're going to defend your home with it, uh, be aware of these things uh, because you'll need to have every – part of the law on your side. So make sure that you make your life easier, not harder. And, uh, you know, make sure you know what your backstop is and where you're shooting. And I think the self-defense conversation, it really brings us to uh, just how interchangeably can you treat an AR-15 and an AK-47? I mean, they were developed to do pretty much identical things. And, uh, and I, I just feel like you, if you want to pick one of the other, it really just comes down to personal preference. I have, you know, I've switched to cartridge comparison now, but what the heck? That's okay. We can talk about it because it's going to come up. And I'm sure we'll have this discussion too, you know, the 762 by 39 versus, you know, the 556. But yeah, I have to agree with you that it's definitely a huge topic of discussion on the internet, right? Everybody is, makes videos about it and, you know, forum posts and things like that. But honestly, you know what? If you like a specific cartridge or a specific rifle, then go for it. Uh, if you really want to get uh, a AR-15 chambered in 762 by 39 you can. There are a few options out there. Uh, the CMMG Mutant is probably one of the best uh, from what mm -hmm. I've seen. Uh, but for the most part, your your 762 by 39 is going to be housed in your AK. That's what it was built for. Uh, that's what it's made for, and it's what it works in best. And, uh, you know, I think pick what you like. If you love your AK, then, dude, rock it. Don't be ashamed of it. Go for it. You don't have to run an AR-15 because it, all of your buddies do. If you are an AK guy or gal, go for it. Enjoy it. Or you can yeah, be the for... rebel and go with the SKS. Whatever trips your trigger that brings us to a prevailing attitude i don't like it's people who see ak-47s and immediately start grousing about communists oh, now, i want gosh, you to be yeah. sure me and chris hate communists oh yeah but firearms and their ammunition do not have politics that is absolutely yeah. correct kaleshnikov would have been a brilliant gunsmith if he'd been born anywhere yep. in the past several centuries and just because the soviets were you know paying for his soup and cabbage doesn't mean what he came up with was any less miraculous really it's such an amazing platform it truly is it truly is an innovation in firearms design it was unique for its time and it really signaled the change that you know we needed these big heavy cartridges and these rifles that could shoot ridiculously long distances i mean let's be honest here you know a 30 out six or a 762 by 54 r can easily shoot out to 600 yards Mm -hmm. And it, it signaled the change and understanding that most combat engagements are going to be under 300 yards. So it's like, why do you need that extra range, that extra weight, that heavier rifle when you could do the same thing with something less? And yeah. I think that really is the the beauty of the 762 by 39 in the AK design. Yeah. I had Kleshnikov developed a rifle that could be pressed into any beet farmer's hands before yep. he got sent to a slaughter on the front. <laughs> and uh what made it good then continues to make it good now. Yes. So, Chris, like so many rounds we compare to each other, the obvious answer is that you should just get both, well, especially clearly. these two. These are just, you know, if you're going to have multiple guns oh, yeah. at some point, you're going to have to have these both. Mm -hmm. Can we really declare one better, or are their applications just too dissimilar to 
even think about declaring a king. I think that we can't, honestly. Uh, you know, it, it all depends on how you frame the argument, right? So if you're going to say, what's the best, you know, battle rifle cartridge, it's going to be the 762 by 39 There's no question. I mean, between these two, as far as, you know, being able to put shots on target faster, you know, being able to carry more ammunition because it's going to be lighter than a 308, uh, the 762 by 39 takes it. Now, if you tell me, hey, Chris, we need to get a rifle round that can shoot out to 600 plus yards, then there's no question it's got to be the 308. So it just comes on how you need to frame what is best, right? We can't say that one is completely better than the other because their applications are so different. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. I have one question for a hand loader okay. about the 762-39. Oh, this is a good one. Yeah, go ahead. This is like the only one where its specs call for more than one bullet diameter. This is something that is misunderstood by a lot of people. And I, I remember this. I'm going to tell this story. So I was teaching a guy how to, to hand load, right, to reload. And he was a big AK shooter, but he also had a 308. And he's like, dude, dude, we could take this 308 bullet and stick it on 7.62 by 39. I'm like, no, we cannot. He's like, well, why? They're the same bullet diameter. I'm like, no, they are not. This is something that uh, a lot of people don't necessarily know because so few people reload for the 762 by 39 uh, just because it's mm -hmm. cheaper to buy factory new ammo than it is to hand load for it. And as we mentioned earlier, most of it's steel case and you can't hand load steel cased ammo. Uh, you can, but unless you want to jack up your dies. It's not worth the trouble. I no, it's do not. It during an apocalypse. No, yeah, not even then. Uh, the, the thing is <laughs> the 762 by 39 actually fires a 0 0.311 diameter bullet and the 308 is... Well, exactly what it says, 0 0.308. So the bullet diameters are actually different between the two. And that be, is because of the way that the uh, caliber is measured between the two countries. Uh, you know, in, in the West, uh, we measure it between uh, the, the grooves in the bullet. So the, the furthest distance apart uh, is the grooves. The Russians do it from the lands. And so, you know, yes, the... Uh, the 7.62 by 39 barrel is a true 308 inch, you know, diameter bullet at the smallest part, but your bullet needs to be larger than that so that it fits in the barrel nice and tight and makes that nice seal. Otherwise, you're just going to have gas escaping from the outside. And so your bullet actually has to be oversized slightly for your barrel. It needs to be sized to the grooves. Uh, and so the grooves on an AK are point are zero point. 311 inches across as opposed to 0 0.308 for uh, how we measure for the uh, the 308 Winchester. So that's the difference, the Russians measuring from the uh, from the lands mm -hmm. as opposed to us doing it from the grooves. That's exactly right. So if you that's were right. to if you were to you know take a caliber and measure that land distance, it would be 7.62. Uh, but uh, be that as it may, the bullet itself has to be larger, but the moniker stuck. Uh, and so it, it can be confusing, especially to new shooters and hand loaders. But the truth is, like we mentioned earlier, you're not going to be reloading 762 by 39 for the most part. Some of your premium hunting rounds, like we talked about earlier, uh, with the 762 by 39 being coming more and more of a hunting round, will actually be brass cased. Mm -hmm. But th that can sometimes even be a liability uh, for your rifle because your AK, your SKS are designed for steel cased ammo. And, Is that so? Mm -hmm, I've heard about this happening huh. where you can get the rims ripped off. You can have problems with extraction with brass because it's too soft. Now, it's very rare. I will be honest with you. Uh, but it, I have seen... Uh, you know, evidence where that has happened before, uh, where the extraction is too violent and it just rips part of the rim off and you get your brass stuck in your, your chamber. It's really interesting. You know, we sell a lot of uh, brass cased bellum 76239. And oh, yeah. uh, gosh, I didn't know there was a liability there. I didn't know the AK's extractor was so violent. It's not like a super huge liability. Like if you have a bunch of, you know, brass K762 by 39, don't freak out and think that you need to sell it or get rid of it. Just shoot it. Uh, you're probably not going to have a problem with it. I would say it becomes more of an issue with reloads uh, because that factory new brass is going to be nice and solid, won't be fire formed to the chamber. Uh, when you reload it, the more you reload it, uh, if you do have a violent extracting rifle, that rim's going to get more and more beat up. 
uh, for extraction. And so then it could potentially cause an issue. But again, it's a very small probability, not something you need to worry about, but it's something just to consider. Hmm. It's good to know. Absolutely. But no, I I think that really kind of sums up 762 by 39 and 308. It really just kind of depends on what you want to use it for and shoot which ones you like. Uh, Dave, do you have any final thoughts? No, I think we've covered it all pretty well. I mean, I'm an 8K47 fanboy myself. uh, So I I insist that our listeners go buy one for themselves. Absolutely. uh, That's it. That's all I have to say. They should also buy their ammo from ammo.com. 100%. And if you haven't done so already, please make sure you click that like and subscribe button down below. Click the little bell icon so you get notified every time we upload a new video here on the channel. And thanks for watching.